Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us, Justin. We appreciate it. Um, this is the Identity and Privacy in Web3 panel, and I am your moderator. Uh, I'm the host of the NFT and Chill podcast, and I'll be introducing our uh, speakers for this panel. Um, first, we have in Ingo from Kilt Protocol. Want to give yourself an introduction, Ingo? Yeah, hi, I'm Ingo from Kill Protocol. I'm the founder. Uh, Kill Protocol, as most of you probably know, is uh, around decentralized identity. So we are implementing uh, DIDs, which are decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials, which together form uh, decentralized digital identity uh, on a blockchain. We're part of the Polkadot ecosystem. That's enough, I think. Awesome. Next, we have Seth Estrada from Mind Your Biz. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on the panel. My name is Seth. I run the outlet MindYour.biz, and I do a bit of infrastructure consulting for institutional uh, groups within the space, including some Web3 marketing agencies, as well as sure. NFT projects and high value blockchain projects, tokens, uh, feasibility, but with a strong emphasis on privacy and uh, and on security. Awesome. Next, we have Robert Grant, CEO of Crown Sterling. Hi, yeah, Crown Sterling is a quantum resistant blockchain platform that utilizes an encryption technology called OneTime Pad. We're the first to, to do that. Uh, OneTime Pad is the same encryption that is used on things like nuclear codes and such. And uh, it's uh, entirely uncrackable because it's based on information theory instead of just uh, you know, number theory and mathematics. Uh, we're also into compression. So we compress our keys for cryptography uh, in a patent solution for that. And we want to be able to provide both compression as well as encryption for, um, for consumers in a decentralized format as well as uh, for other blockchains as well. That are looking to become uh, quantum resistant and compliant with kind of the new standards that are coming out now that quantum computers are available. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're gonna talk about identity in Web3 and the importance of it and kind of, you know, that's, uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with Seth and, you know, can you speak a little bit about the importance of identity in, in Web3 and kind of um, what it means to, to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, my journey into blockchain and into Web3 allowed me to start to see early on that pseudonymity was the name of the game for a lot of years. And identity was something that didn't seem desirable for a long time. So, I mean, you can tell the, the, the old dogs that still care to have the Bitcoin logo anywhere in their branding or still, you know, we still believe, right? Uh, hard to shake the faith, right? Of, a, of an old Bitcoin believer or Bitcoin most lists like me. But pseudonymity was the name of the game. It wasn't really uh, identity as such. We wanted to know that we could quickly change things. And then it was very high touch being able to achieve some level of anonymity, right? Like you got to do all these things. You got to understand how Tor works got to understand uh, your your uh, IP hygiene, right? Using VPNs and understanding who the service providers are for your VPNs and the combination of services that you have to put together and then also start doing key provisioning on your own. Um, there's, there's It's a crazy journey, right, that we've been on. But fast forward to today with all these newer solutions that are coming into play so that we don't have to worry quite so much about the implications of having an ID, like an actual identification that we stand behind and then being able to either behind, you know, custom ZK proofs or some other layers and, uh, and other encryption tunnels and, uh, and, um, and gates and such, being able to just release the parts of information that we want. It's great to see that we're finally getting there. It was a dream for years, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of my take on it. I, I, I like looking at this and trying to evaluate where all the, the threat surfaces are, where all the attack surfaces are, because because that's what I have to do for my clients, right? Like, how do we prevent absolute financial ruin by by being insecure with the way that we hold this, this information? So it's great to know that we're almost at the point where for the retail participant, it is turnkey. Yeah, absolutely. I think, 
you know, the space is is growing, but you know, it, uh, safety, privacy, things like that are, are extremely important for the growth of the space and for new people coming in. Because you know, a lot of the average person, they you know, when they hear DeFi and NFTs and blockchain and all that, they get you know kind of hesitant because of the security and safety and privacy issues. So it's good to see you know companies like you know everyone on stage here that are trying to help bridge that gap with being safe and private in the space. Um, in Ingo, can you, I guess, describe what identity in Web3 means to, means to you and Kilt Protocol? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think identity is uh, one of the great promises of Web3. Uh, Web3 was a little bit renamed in, in the last half year <laughs> by industry, probably. Uh, but uh, what we actually thought of when we started this Web3 movement in 2016, 2017, uh, was that we looked at Web2 and uh, we looked at everything that was wrong there. And there were a lot of things wrong, basically, because uh, it, was, uh, it was just an application layer built on a very, very small uh, internet protocol uh, layer. So we said actually we have to bring things which are necessary for everyone. We have to bring them out of the application layer, away from the Facebooks of the world, um, and into a protocol layer which is owned by basically everyone. And uh, ownership is definitely one of the big things there. And this is uh, the NFT part, uh, but uh, identity is another one which is uh, even more corrupt, basically, in the Web two um, than, uh, than than ownership because ownership just didn't exist. Um, and uh, this is why we set out and, and founded this company uh, in 2018 to solve exactly that problem. And at the same time, there was uh, the forming of the uh, of the decentralized identity foundation, the DIF, uh, which uh, now includes more than 300 companies, including smaller ones like blockchain companies, but also bigger ones like Microsoft and IBM, uh, where we uh, set out to uh, define standards how to actually. Um, code an identity and what uh, define what actually an identity is because identity is not identification an identifier in the physical world would be for example my face and in the uh, blockchain world would be probably my uh, wallet address or something uh, but this is not enough identity grows in the in the physical world like you get more and more credentials from trusted entities like the driver's license your passport or your library card your whatever you have your university degree and these credentials are always linked to your identifier so they have a picture of my face for example um, and, uh, and and then I own them and then I can do with my uh, credentials whatever I, I want to do right I can go to a bar and show my driver's license to prove my age and this is totally asymmetric because the people who issued this driver's license to they don't know that I visited this bar. So this is total privacy, actually, right? And um, as, as, as you just said, um, uh, disclosing parts of this uh, of, of credential is also a very important part. We call that selective disclosure. You can do this with uh, with your driver's license. You can basically put your finger uh, in front of your name, right? Why does the bar guy needs to know what uh, what your name is? He needs to see the picture compared with your face and, and then see the date of birth and see if you're 18 and then he has to check maybe if this uh, credential is actually a valid credential um, because it was issued by a trusted entity that he trusts and then um, you, you get going somehow and in the web 2 we basically ch uh, changed this really successful model which was working for like 500 years uh, we changed it to now everything is owned by Facebook and you have nothing and uh, they start communicating with other services about your credentials which they hold which you never see and uh, uh, this was so wrong and uh, in the web 3 we basically what we made is that we took all this uh, the processes from the physical world and we re-implemented them in the digital world so that you can now create your own identifier on your computer um, that you uh, can be a trusted entity which issues uh, credentials that you can hold your credentials and that you choose who you shared who to share your credentials with and this is 
I think um, the solution for it, and uh, I'm pretty happy that we finalized the uh, the standardization part and also the implementation part. So this is all there now, and this is uh, for for developers. This is great news actually because you can now start building applications on top of these things. Right? They are standardized and uh, they are implemented and they are ready to you. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's awesome. I think you know you mentioned you know. The difference between Web 2 and Web 3 was, was learning from our mistakes. And I think that's what's really awesome about, you know, the space as a whole, like with even with cryptocurrency and DeFi, like we're trying to make it better for for everyone and learn from the mistakes that, you know, government controlled fiat have made. So, you know, I think that was a great point. Um, and uh, for digital identity in the space, you know, the average person uses, like you said, ENS names, their wallet addresses, unstoppable domains. Some people even use their NFTs as their digital identity um, in Web3. And I think, you know, that is, as the space moves forward, I think that will get, you know, more prevalent. So, Robert, um, can you explain what you know, digital identity means to you and Crown Sterling. Sure. You know, let me put it in brass tacks, I guess. You know, I have uh, uh, a Telegram following personally, and yet when you do a search on Telegram for my name, there are nine different Robert Edward Grants with my same logo and everything. And it made me think immediately of like Metaverse because I think, you know, most of us would probably agree that it's not going to be that there's only one metaverse. There's going to be many. And and what's going to basically transit through those different metaverses will be the identity that you choose, your own avatar, right? Whatever that avatar is. I have, you know, a significantly high social media presence. And so I have the same kind of marketing look and feel and everything for that avatar, if you will, in social media. And I think it's going to likely be the same on um you know, in metaverse and in Web3. So how do we protect ourselves from just everybody being able to step in and say they're, you know, they used to be the Nigerian prince that's now you, right? Yeah. And <laughs> that's kind of the reality of the situation, right? So, yeah. and, and it's crazy because they have bots as well. They've gotten really, the Nigerian prince got sophisticated because they have <laughs> bots that go into my telegram and they actually copy all my original content and they post it on there so people that go on the other pages and some of the other pages have more followers than my page does. It's hilarious. It's like, you know, there are pages with my name on it that have like 10,000 followers on Telegram and heaven forbid that happens on, you know, Instagram and Facebook, but very likely it already is happening, right? People are getting hacked all the time. So I think that what, what we're trying to do is we have created a product in addition to our quantum resistant cryptography which I think is going to be critically important to be able to protect your identity. Um, and then also combining that with our unique mathematical compression technology, what we've also built is the quantum resistant VPN. So my phone right now has on it a quantum resistant VPN that I can turn on. It's backed by one time pad. It encrypts everything on my phone, all of my data, all of my geolocation, all of my uh, search history, everything gets encrypted. So even though uh, still the other carriers that you know, are, have relationships with it, whether it's Facebook or whether it's uh, Amazon or whomever, that can reach into my phone, they may get access to my data, but it's all encrypted with one-time pad, so they can't do anything with it. It's like worthless to them. I think that's the first step that we're gonna each start having to think about taking. It's no longer just about encrypted messaging apps, which none of the current encrypted messaging apps are quantum resistant. But it's gonna be about having our entire digital lives, which are really just an extension of our own identities, be now protected because we can encrypt through like quantum resistant VPNs and phone communications and everything, such that you know none of that data can be used by another party. I just wrote a book that's gonna be coming out, it's getting published by a publishing house called Greenleaf um, and uh, Fast Company you may have heard of. And basically the name of the book is NeuroMind, but it's not M-I-N-D, it's M-I-N-E-D, because we're all being NeuroMind of data. Data is the new oil, it's the most valuable asset in the world. And we believe that, you know, it actually 
gives a real possibility of a true, you know, basic universal, universal basic income for people if we could be the ones who actually can benefit from the original production of our own data. And if we can blockchain that data, but first in order to blockchain it, you have to encrypt it, you have to put a fence around it. So we've created an ecosystem within Crown Sterling so that people will be able to do that. And I, you know, I think this is gonna be a critical aspect of, uh, of being able to protect your identity, which ultimately your identity is gonna be your most valuable asset. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, identity has been become so important in Web3 and like building your social equity on, you know, these social platforms in the metaverse on Twitter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's become kind of, you know, almost as important as anything else in the space is is your identity and, and the social equity you can create in the space. I mean, I think so, about how much money we spend on this and time and effort, you know. On, on Instagram and Facebook, I have under just under my name about half a million followers. Yeah. And what happens if all of a sudden someone comes in and just takes that over and I have no way to stop that? Yeah, and absolutely. Talk about a massive value attrition. It's it's incredible. Well, and even when I when I was making you know the post about this panel. I, you know, I was adding all of all of you on here, and your also your companies as well. And I noticed that there were, you know, three or four Robert Grants who were trying to pose as you, and also there were four different Crown Sterlings. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a freaking nightmare. So it needs to be, and that's why I started the company is because I thought, geez, we need to have some mechanism for this. It can't just be pound sand. At least Instagram has mechanisms, you know, like you can get the blue tick and stuff like that um, and verifications with them. But but Telegram doesn't have anything right no. now. And and when you think about where this could go with Metaverse and Web3, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the privacy and the safety of the space definitely need to catch up with the technology. Um, that's for sure. So we're moving to Seth. Um, what do you think is the future of technology and you know safety in the space? I mean, unpopular opinion. It's going to be hybrid. It's uh, it, it, we we already operate within a blend of centralized and decentralized infrastructure. Even when we talk about Web three, right, and metaverse in particular, right. I mean, it would be it'd be computationally just too heavy a burden to bear to have every single interaction recorded to any blockchain. Even if you have the most highly performing blockchain in the world, if you have every single gamer in the world choosing to commit every single action at all times, it would just be poor contract design, right? To uh, to commit all that data to a blockchain. So we're already dealing with the realities of the upper limit of performance on blockchain when we talk about not, not ID, but metaverse. So since we have uh, digital ID becoming such a, an essential component of metaverse i think it's also fair to presume that a lot of the uh, a lot of the future of that digital id is going to be leaning on blockchain yes for checkpointing yes for uh, for being able to store certain amounts of, uh, of data transaction hashes and, and even just uh, initial hashes for for commits of of identification uh, identifying bits of info but i mean encryption isn't broken a lot of encryption isn't broken. It's good that also we're hearing about quantum encryption uh, being pioneered right now so that it never does break. Uh, but let's be very clear, encryption doesn't require decentralization. So I, I believe the future is going to be of finding that blend of decentralized and centralized infrastructure to be able to serve the needs of of every right citizen of the of the future metaverses and if there does ultimately become you know one metaverse to rule them all how do we make sure that we maintain our sovereignty before they fully take over yeah absolutely taking the best of both worlds is is the best option uh robert someone has asked what is the name of the vpn um uh, it's going to be called orion 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 okay, thank you thank you Okay, moving on to Ingo. Uh, same question. How do you, what do you think of for the future of identity in the space and also, you know, safety to go along with it? 
Yeah, so uh, identity, I think, is something that will generally be decentralized. Um, but Seth is absolutely right. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything has to be decentralized. Blockchains are not very good in computing, and they are extremely bad in storing things. Um, so uh, why would so when you look at use cases which you meet, uh, I think 95% of them are better off on on the centralized service. Uh, and then there's those 5% which really need a blockchain, and uh, then you should go on blockchain. Uh, so I think that uh, actually identity is one of the things which will remain on blockchain because because um, we have seen already in the past that centralization of identity data is absolutely dangerous. Uh, and I'm not talking about governments, because the, the, as I said, the government, DI, uh, the, the government ID is basically really decentralized, because not every credential that I own is issued by the government. Most of them actually are not. They are issued by banks, they are issued by libraries, they are issued by universities, they are issued by schools, they are issued by a lot of things, and not by the government. There's only this passport and maybe the driver's license comes from government. So it is actually already decentralized. Um, and uh, also the face is totally decentralized because no government gave me that face. I somehow didn't <laughs> uh, So uh, that, that's definitely decentralized and it will be decentralized in the future because when we see uh, the problems and, and the enormous power uh, which has uh, uh, accumulated with just a handful of companies all around the world, um, uh, by storing the digital identity of people, uh, this is something that definitely has to end. And uh, any solution out of that, uh, where, where you would assume a uh, somehow permissioned or uh, centralized or private entity, even if it's a consortium of, uh, of, of companies or whatever, which would take care, or, or of governments, even worse, uh, which would take care of your identity, then uh, you're screwed in the end, right? So uh, this is something where we are absolutely, where we can safely say that uh, industry has already understood. Uh, some governments still have some issues with understanding, uh, but sometimes they are a little bit slower, um, and and governments will understand that as well. So if you if you look at government identity uh, projects right now, especially in the European Union where I live, uh, it is all like, hey, can we do this on a permission blockchain? Um, well, they will find out later that this probably won't work uh, so good because it is somehow centralized again. And then when we have the metaverses, people will start earning money in the metaverse, and then the governments will come and say, well, uh, actually, where's my tax cut, which I want to have out of that, and then they will move into decentralized identity because it will be already there in the metaverse. So uh, my prediction is probably this is going to take another seven, eight years or so, uh, but uh, it, it's definitely going to happen. And uh, so for identity, this is the technology, decentral uh, decentralized is the right technology. For many other things, it is definitely not. So gaming uh, is has some parts which can be made on a blockchain, but the high computation stuff is on either going to be edge computing or it is uh, on central service. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Robert, we're actually going to ask you a different question because you mentioned that you know how important it is to protect you know identity in with social media and how difficult it can be. Can be. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the, for the future, like does Crown Sterling or yourself have anything coming that is going to protect someone's identity, you know, on social media, in the metaverse, anything like that? Can you speak on that? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely in our plan. It'll be an extension of the Orion app, which right now is in beta. Uh, you know, I've got it on my phone. It's pretty cool. When you land in, I go to Dubai pretty often, and when I, you land in Dubai, the government has a standing practice to literally like tap into your phone. I don't know if you guys knew that, but it's true. And um, and so they get access to your data and information right away, but not if you have VPN, which is kind of nice. And and also, I just want to make one thing clear. The U.S. government just announced, you guys might, might not be aware of this yet, but the U.S. but you can look it up. The U.S. government just announced uh, a few months ago, starting in February, from the White House that every branch of the U.S. government has to be transitioning over from um, encryption protocols that are not quantum resistant, like elliptic curve, as well as um, RSA encryptions, uh, over to quantum resistant protocols, which include really only one time pad, and then there's three others that they just mentioned. And that is a big, big thing that they've literally just did a, a massive thing on. 
Uh, so you can look at that. It's not happening yet in blockchain because there's nobody in the blockchain world. There's no real advocacy that unites all the blockchain companies to then say, okay, we need to basically make a cutover and change. Uh, and I, I think that there's, there should be something like that, quite frankly. But, but basically, that, is, that has happened. So I think there's going to be a need for uh, quantum resistance uh, within the, the blockchain community uh, very, you know, very soon. Uh, if, if, you know, certainly at least in following with where the U.S. government, every branch of the U.S. government has to be compliant with within the next month now already. Uh, the other thing is, you're right, it doesn't have to be on blockchain. Encryption doesn't have to be on blockchain. Um, you know, we provide encryption products also through one of our other businesses called Theon to, you know, companies like IBM, the U.S. government and others, right? And uh, none of it is blockchain oriented. However, uh, we did want to be able to create a mechanism so that other blockchains would be able to use our quantum resistant encryption uh, as a wrapper. So it's a wrap that goes around and you pay a small gas fee uh, for doing so, but it's a wrap that goes around. And in that, you can, uh, it also includes things like decentralized key storage and decentralized storage of, of data as well uh, with using our compression technology that we utilize to develop our our key compression for one-time pad. Because with one-time pad, every single character has to be individually encrypted. So if you have a gigabyte file, you have a gigabyte key. That's why it's very, very robust. We figured out how to do it. Um, and and that compression makes it very possible that it's actually even more efficient from a you know storage space capacity requirement than, than you know current compressions uh, as well as current methods for key storage, which generally don't really use compression. Now, as far as like what kinds of technologies we will provide uh, in addition to our you know, quantum VPN, the quantum VPN actually is a combination wallet. It's a combination uh, messaging app as well. So it's got full messaging capabilities within it. Eventually it'll be a social platform also for people to be able to connect uh, with each other. So you can kind of think like a combination of, of Venmo, uh, except that it won't be showing everybody what they're purchasing. What they're purchasing, I can't stand that about Venmo. And um, and then, but also it'll have kind of like a, a social uh, aspect that you can utilize and build within a community if you want all of it in a decentralized network. Our whole uh, framework is built on a polka dot substrate, and we're also moving towards a parachain. So, uh, and we've had meetings with Parity, which is really exciting about that. And. And uh, I think we're, we're, we're kind of well down the path on that now. And, and then the other aspect of this is that this quantum VPN as well will eventually have the ability for you to encrypt, as it were, and protect your identity so that it can't be used across you know, multiple different platforms. Uh, we haven't thought about yet for general social media. Uh, we might. But certainly we are building that into our avatar approach uh, for, you know, an avatar that could be built that could go and, and transact and go across multiple different metaverse environments. So think of it like as an encryption shield. That's awesome. We lost our moderator. Just going to respond. Yeah, I know. <laughs> sounds, wow. sounds great. Yeah, yeah. We can, we can wrap. We can wrap encryption for a while too. I mean, so NIST, as you know, this month they they only just released their four candidates yeah. for for quantum resistant encryption. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, they they had a couple of year, few years that, that they had that mm -hmm. that project going, and so no, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for the you know for the, the also, uh, chats yeah, also, after uh, our panel. Excited about uh, you, Robert, coming into uh, the Polkadot ecosystem. So uh, welcome, and uh, I, I think we will have some fun together <laughs> in the future. I think so too. No, I'd love to connect with you guys uh, whenever after, and I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can write it in the chat, but. But it looks like our, our moderator's back. So, you know, the yeah, I'm back. So, the, we're actually reaching the end of the panel. We have some really awesome people coming up next. So, uh, real quick, we'll just go around and tell everybody where they can find you and your company. Uh, Seth Estrada, why don't you go first? Sure, I kept it really simple. This link right here will forward you to a YouTube channel. That's the fastest way to hear from me, and I'm very interactive there. I've also uh, mine your underscore biz on Twitter, and uh, yeah, very interactive there. Love to chat. DMs are open. Please don't abuse them. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Ingo, why don't you tell people where they can find you in Kill Protocol? 
Hilt.io. There you find all the social stuff, and uh, you find me, and you find the group, and you find uh, everyone in there. Excellent. Robert Grant from Crown Sterling. Yeah. Mine is just crownsterling.io, uh, but also you can find uh, stuff uh, on my social media at just Robert Edward Grant uh, and um, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on all those different things. Excellent, excellent. I want to thank all of you for coming up and you know giving so much great information in this panel. And uh, I'm the mayor, also Ty Greenfield on uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn. You can find me everywhere. Um, you can also catch the NFT and Chill podcast on any platform that pays that plays uh, podcasts. So I also want to thank uh, DecentralCon for putting on this event and having us come up and speak. This was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you both. Yeah, nice good to meet, meet you guys. You. All right, all the best.